You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling up business coach, Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeldt. I'm your host. And our guest today is Carrie Santos. She is CEO of the Entrepreneurs Organization. Uh, for those that don't know, I know we have a lot of EO members. I've been an EO member for a long time. Is a global network of entrepreneurs. I think, forget the numbers offhand, 13,000 some network entrepreneurs across the globe, 50 some, 60 some odd countries, I think now, but really a worldwide organization of entrepreneurs helping each other with their businesses, helping better leaders and communities. And we're going to have a conversation about what's going on in the world right now. Obviously, we're in the kind of the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic, obviously hip hitting all countries uh, really at this point at various levels. But we're going to talk a little about what's happening with business, what's happening with entrepreneurs, how are entrepreneurs being affected, and also how are entrepreneurs responding to the crisis. I always believe that entrepreneurs are one of the great uh, kind of community leaders and can take action and deal with these kind of things. So I'm excited to have this conversation. I'm excited to find out what we're learning what we're seeing globally, how the entrepreneurs organization is helping entrepreneurs globally really um, uh, deal with this, deal with this crisis and, and, and hopefully come out the other side of this uh, strong, uh, helping build communities and, and really helping uh, helping us get through this. With that, Carrie, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Bruce. This is a really great opportunity to get the word out, as you just said, about what entrepreneurs are doing to really impact this crisis. Yeah. So I don't know how much I butchered the stats on the on on EO at this point. I've, I've been involved in the organization for a long time and I, I, I may not have the most recent ones, but where are we now as an organization in terms of reach, in terms of countries? Give us a little bit of perspective for those that aren't as familiar with EO about what it is and, and how it's organized and from a global organization now, what it impacts. Sure. I'll try to do it in a, a quick nutshell. We're 14,500 entrepreneurs around the world. And for those of you who don't know us, it's not for the startup businesses. It's for those businesses that have already achieved a great deal of success, making it over the hurdle of earning 1 million annual revenue each year. And we're in 62 countries, 198 chapters. We really started as a North American organization, but now we're fully 50% outside the U.S. and Canada. So we're growing in Japan, in mainland China. We're huge in Europe, in Netherlands, and Germany. So it's really, really organization with global reach. Yeah. One of the things I have certainly appreciated in my EO experience is is that global connection and being able to show up in another country, another city and tap the network and reach out to EOers and immediately feel a connection. And I think that's one of the, the real benefits that this kind of global organization has. And I think in this time, you know, the dealing with the things that we're dealing with is a great asset. So I'm, I'm excited to find out kind of how EO is kind of approaching this, what, what you've learned. Tell me a little bit about, I guess, your role as CEO. I'm not sure if you ever imagined that you would be, you know, at the helm of an organization like this in a time like this. But tell me a little bit about your role in the organization and and what you're focused on uh, as CEO at this point in time. Sure. So although we're a chapter based organization and each of our 198 chapters usually has one or two staff members, I lead 130 global staff who are trying to support the whole infrastructure, who are creating tools, curriculum, everything that the chapter needs to succeed, as well as supporting our global committees that do like the research and development, the regional councils that support each of the chapters. So a pretty small number of staff supporting 14,500 because really the local chapters do 
a lot of work delivering value and benefit to their members right in their own town. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess when did when did this first kind of come on your radar? Like when did this first become an issue, something that you saw as something that organization actually needed to start paying attention to or having a plan for? Tell us about how this came up for you as leader. Yeah, it, it was absolutely during the Lunar New Year or the Chinese New Year, because the, the impact in mainland China was so severe. Uh, we really saw it at first as quite a regional issue. So we had staff quarantined. We had members uh, in lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of concern about how our members in China were going to be able to survive a shutdown of business yeah. and a lockdown and how we could uh, reach them with resources, with tools. So in a, in a funny way, we kind of had a trial run. I mean, for those people there, it was absolutely terrifying and miserable, but we were very focused on the needs of about, say, 300 members in mm -hmm. mainland China. And uh, we have members in the food and beverage industry who, you know, lost 90 percent of their business. Yeah. overnight. Yeah. We also had, we have a really agile setup in China. I don't know if you're very familiar with WeChat, but it is a single oh, yeah. form that you run your life on in China. So we were able to do a member survey really early on and find out how our members were being impacted. And from that survey, we heard right from the start that 58% of all of our members there said they were facing a significant impact. And 17% said that 90% of their revenue had been impacted. So we knew this was extremely severe. But with that survey, we could also ask, what do you need the most from us? What are the biggest areas where you want to learn more? And number one, cash flow. We're yeah, actually yeah. around cash flow. And the thing is, we have a lot of great resources on cash flow, but we also, based on that feedback, started setting up in Mandarin webinars in those time zones from key members who are expert in that area, uh, tailoring to every business need they needed. So we started with cash flow, but the second highest need was just, you know, surviving a crisis. People had who had been through crisis. Yeah. A lot of our members in Japan who'd lived through a tsunami, who yeah. lived through some really terrible natural disasters, then shared their experiences with those members in China. Uh, we did that all through interpretation on mm -hmm. Zoom, which is kind of incredible. And it really made a difference. So what's also interesting, you know, those members are about two and a half months ahead of us. Yeah. And they are actually seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I can't tell you how much that comforts me. Yeah. You know, they, they have another side. They're already saying they can see it. We have half of our members in China saying they think it will be over by April. Wow. Fabulous for them. They, you know, starting in late January, done. Wow. Meaning ending by April, meaning what? That they're going to be back to more or less that business as normal? They think that they can be back to business as usual by the end of April. Yeah. And, and of that 50%, I think 30% said the end of March. So it's really encouraging. Yeah. And that watching it develop there where we could be intensely focused on 300 at once, it, it mm -hmm. kind of helped us build out a toolkit. If I think if I knew right away, oh gosh, you have to help 14,000, it might have been overwhelming. But mm -hmm. we re really learned a lot that surveying them, showing them the survey results, and then showing them the webinars we were doing to meet those needs was really effective. So we're getting high ratings. The members there are saying that they're either very satisfied or satisfied with the ways we were able to offer them services remotely in that time period. Yeah, it's really, it's one of the interesting, I mean, you know, interesting, maybe a point choice of words, but you know, it's the situation that we're in, you know, we're both here on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, I'm, I'm in New York, you're down in DC area, but we're, you know, we haven't seen the wave hit yet, right? Like we're yeah. just at the beginning of this. And that's one of the really odd, eerie kind of situations that I find many of the people that I'm talking to that are in, you know, leadership positions, running businesses, uh, operating businesses, is there's this kind of looming, well, it's going to get worse, but we're not sure exactly how much worse, exactly when we're trying to predict the crest, we're trying to predict how quickly it's going to recover. And it's interesting to see, you know, that this insight around the, the around China and how they, they've kind of gone through this. I guess how much have you been able to kind of see what might be different for, you know, countries in Europe, countries in the United States in terms of how they respond to it? I mean, I think we're seeing, you know, obviously Europe is, is a bit more advanced. I mean, they're, they're hopefully in a peak or close to a peak. I think in the U.S. we're just getting started. Certainly, you know, New York is, is one of the hot zones here. Any differences in terms of how you see people responding or 
how things are playing out, either because of you know geography, government situations, politics. I mean, what what are the yeah. differences yeah, that you're seeing? We had a really telling, important webinar now almost two weeks ago with our chapter in Italy, which is a new chapter. It's a small chapter. Yeah. And it so happens that it's based primarily in northern Italy because that's where sorts yeah. of businesses we have are operating. So we had the president of our Italy chapter and president-elect do a webinar that was, I don't, I think it was organized in about eight hours. There were, mm -hmm. you know, 150 participants and now it's been listened to many, many, many more times because they basically basically were calling out to us three weeks into their quarantine. And that, again, was a really helpful emotional point to see how they were feeling three weeks in and quite a different approach by the Italian government. You know, in China, because of the way WeChat works, the Chinese government actually could monitor very closely your movements mm. and know if you were or were not abiding by the quarantine. And uh, people in China do take the government's rules extremely yeah. seriously, as I've heard from our members there. Yeah. And you know, Italy, different setup. That's not what you would expect. But but what was so telling from our members in Italy where, you know, three weeks in, they were at the point where there was a lot more government regulation. I believe they were explaining that only one member of the house is supposed to leave at a certain time. You yeah. have, have a certain purpose. And they were describing a member who'd been fined 200 euros for getting cigarettes. And the police officer said that wasn't a valid excuse. Wow. They were talking much more about the inner motivation to be quarantined. I, I'm sure people yeah. in China felt the same, but they were talking about about, we know our hospital is overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. We know my neighbors down the block died. And they were very, very adamant about the social distancing, about staying at home, about really not even going out into the street much because of the, the real disaster facing their hospitals. Now, actually, I don't want to overstate it because they were explaining to us that they do have excellent, excellent health care in Italy. And for people who don't know or don't pay attention, they might not have yeah. been aware. And they were comparing, you know, the number of ICU beds on Europe. I mean, very, very high standards and the standards in northern Italy are excellent. But even so, the overwhelm, the, the way the system was yeah. overwhelmed, the way the poor doctors and healthcare workers were being impacted. It was such a good signal for those of us who maybe can't rely on our government to say you can or you can't do this, but hearing their internal motivation was so eye-opening. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really the um, sort of, as, as this plays out in different countries, it will be uh, sort of determining how how people respond. Well, first of all, what the government regulations are, what, what the government does in terms of setting up, you know, controls and taking measures and declaring, you know, actions and restrictions, and then and how well people follow them. And, and I mean, we're seeing it play out in New York on a kind of microcosm basis. But yeah, that the whole kind of response, community, government response, interaction will be quite, I think will have a huge impact on how this plays out. Tell me about, you know, as, as you sort of see the business reaction to this, what are the businesses that are clearly kind of more affected, less affected? What are the response strategies that you're seeing from the different types of business leaders, uh, you know, across, you know, different cultures and the different industries? What insights do you have at this point? Yeah, well, there's no doubt that the, the first emergency cries came from our members in hotels, tourism, mm, food and yeah. beverage, events. I mean, you know, they're they're absolutely the first to see, you know, their future bookings just dry up overnight. I'm thinking of a particular member who, you know, 90% of her bookings were gone, really sharing on a lot of group chats, geez, you know, any tips for me having to lay off all of my workers today. But she very quickly pivoted to food delivery service. And it's something, it, you know, it's mm -hmm. a start. It's a new way yeah. to go forward. And uh, she's based in Chicago where my parents live. And I ordered my parents dinner from her business, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to help with my little piece. But, you know, that's part of it that usually entrepreneurs, they, they don't give up. They're just shifting. OK, what's the opportunity I can fill in this space? And I'm just amazed how quickly someone can go from sort of, oh, my God, I can't believe my business of 25 years imploded to, OK, let me take the next step and see where this can go. Yeah, I, I always say that uh, entrepreneurs to start a business, you need to be slightly delusional. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, the, the chances of success are low, the work that you put into it. But it's also the greatest strength. I mean, I think, you know, entrepreneurs are willing to try things and do things that don't actually appear kind of rational or sane at times. And I think times like this is it's a great strength of entrepreneurship, right? Because yeah, you, you can kind of put aside 
all the craziness and all the drama and all the things that you should, that are, are, are perfect excuses to do nothing and actually do something, actually kind of take the bull by the horns and saying, all right, where are, where is there opportunities? How can I get traction? What can I do today to actually make some progress on something? And I think that's ultimately the, the real power of entrepreneurs. And I, I, I certainly believe that, you know, it will be one of the major forces and help us, help us get through this and then recover from it. Right. Um, you know, this is a group that's not afraid of the economic consequences we're facing because because so many members, you can talk to them. Well, I was almost bankrupt yeah. in this year. Yeah. I lost 90% yeah. of my business after 9-11. They have seen it before yeah. and they know they can get through it. And that kind of confidence, I love working in this setting because it helps me not get down. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, one of the things I'm personally doing is I hold a happy hour, a virtual happy hour on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I invite all of, all of my kind of EO friends, entrepreneurial friends, and, and we just chat. And, we, and it's and it's that kind of energy, right? It's about how do we, yes, recognize the challenging situation we're in, but also where can we find things we can actually do, you know, things that we can make a difference, start moving things forward, you know, recognize the situation, but also not let it stop us. And I think that's a huge power for entrepreneurs. Um, Tell me a little bit about some of the businesses that have not maybe been as affected as, as by as you, as you look across EO chapters and, and EO members. Do you notice anything about businesses that seem to be not nearly affected, at least initially here in the, or in the early stages of this, by the, the situation that's playing out? Yeah, absolutely. We have businesses in uh, online sales, online marketing. And I know they're doing well because they're putting their hands up and offering to members who need to learn how to do online sales and marketing. They're offering their resources often for free just to help people learn how to operate it in a different way. In addition, we have a large number of members that have different aspects of remote work that they handle. So either they have you know, virtual assistants. We have a member in Vietnam who has a work from home platform he's giving to fellow members of our organization, EO, a teledoc service oh, in yeah. India, offering services around the world. So a lot of our businesses that were already not brick and mortar have a ton of capacity, a ton of insight, and they're really wanting to help others who, who are just going down that journey. Yeah, again, an another wonderful part of EO, just the um, helpfulness, the willingness for members to help other members and really help other entrepreneurs in general uh, yes. is, is a great, you know, one of the great core values, I think, of, of the organization. You know, as you look through, you know, kind of dealing with the, the current situation and kind of the current crisis and helping people get through this, looking at kind of the next step and the rebuilding side, anything that you see in terms of things that we're going to need to put in place or, or the process that's going to happen once we kind of get through like the wave of, of COVID, but then the rebuilding process, anything there that you see needs to be kind of thought about or put in place or invested in at this point so that we can see a, a strong recovery after this? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think we should call up our, some members from, from China and get yeah. exactly their advice on how they're getting back on their feet and how it's going, because I haven't heard too much from their side. There was a lot of discussion in China about building really strong employee and staff culture in this period. And I think their hope was that digging in, especially with remote work on everything you can do to build a culture around your core values, them seeing that is really the path that was mm -hmm. going to help them get to the other side. I, I think when I think about the messages, that that's one that's come up a lot. And I, I believe they're really seeing that as the way forward as things start to, to change and improve. Yeah, I can't help but think that this is going to have some irreversible changes to the way we do business or at least think about business or, you know, how we make our businesses more resilient to to things like this. I don't think I don't think anyone someone may have had this in their business continuity plan. <laughs> some some I small paragraph so. somewhere in their chat in there. But you know, this definitely gets us to rethink, you know, where, where businesses are vulnerable, where industries are vulnerable, supply chains, all those kind of things. Tell us a little bit more about what EO is doing in terms of trying to muster resources, pull together information for its members. How have you kind of activated the organization to help the those that are in need. And obviously, this is going to change as different countries kind of get to different stages. But how are you kind of approaching the that process of pulling together things for EO members? Yes, absolutely. So what's interesting, our members communicate on so many different channels. I just think it's a symptom of our, our modern era. So we have members who primarily communicate on WhatsApp. We have mm -hmm. those who are on WeChat. We have those who are using Slack. So we're actually engaged in a, a heavy listening campaign in all of those different, you know, Facebook as well, trying to make sure we hear 
what members are concerned about, what their needs are, and compiling that into like a weekly listening report so we yeah. can keep up with the latest trends. I myself, when I'm on Facebook and I see something, I cut and paste it into the staff side so people are keeping up with you know what people are talking about, what they're concerned about. Interestingly, we have an online learning platform that you know was launched a couple of years ago, a you know, moderate success, but because we're an organization where that in-person meeting was really the critical element, I would say it's probably been under leveraged mm -hmm. up to now. Yeah, but exactly. now, thank goodness we had it in place. We're using the online learning management system to collate and curate the new content that's just come out in the last few weeks. So all the webinars are there. They're all uh, have different hashtags on, okay, this is for cash. This is for remote work. This is for employee culture. So we have both the prior types of information that have been shared in various learning events there, as well as the really new stuff. And you can easily go on there and search it. But at the same time, our members, as they were doing different webinars and different learning opportunities for members this week, we pretty much asked every single one, well, is this just for our organization or do you want to share it with all entrepreneurs? And the overwhelming answer has been, no, no, we want to share it with everybody. Mm -hmm. And that, that really is this, the spirit of our organization. So we're building out on our public website resources that we just haven't made available before where um, different, not just webinars and, and podcasts, but also written resources. You know, this is what your employee manual can look like. This is what your small business loan application can look like also for just businesses at large. And again, we're an interesting, you know, innovative network. So the Seattle chapter and the Atlanta chapter already have public facing resources that anybody can log into now. It's yeah. not geographically limited. So we're just trying to pull all that together and share in both ways because really EO members don't want other businesses to suffer. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that correlating, um, bringing that information together is going to be key. I know uh, a lot of the the CEOs and the entrepreneurs that I that I work with, um, you know, quite honestly, they're they're still kind of in panic mode, right? And so they they can get a lot of information thrown at them, and it's just you know sorting through it, figuring out which stuff I should read, which should I I should not read. So having an organization like you just kind of go through and say, hey, look, here here's here's what you need to know. Here's the here's the right information. Here's the best information to follow uh, is going to be key as people kind of figure out how to process this. And, and get through it quickly because, you know, time, unfortunately, is a bit of an element here. Like the longer that you don't take action, you know, the more at risk you are. So I think it's great that you're pulling that together. For me personally, I know one of the big elements of my EO experience was forum groups and kind of the support that that my fellow entrepreneurs gave me through all sorts of challenges that I had, you know, business and otherwise. Um, how how are kind of the forums, I guess, playing a role in this? Have you seen any insight in terms of what forums are doing to help form mates out, you know, both within chapters, across chapters? Yes, Give me a absolutely. sense there. Absolutely. And uh, for those of you not in EO, a forum tends to be a a support group, about six to 10 people from different industries that is your bread and butter experience. You know, once a month, you're, you're going there and really getting great insights into, you know, your, your business, your life, your values. Uh, so forums, it's interesting. We had been experimenting with virtual forum pilots. Mm -hmm. In general, it was something that was developed for in-person and it wasn't planned for this kind of thing. It's been around for, for quite a long time. But we're so glad that we had piloted yeah. the virtual forum because absolutely now it's no longer a pilot. Like it's mainstream. <laughs> it's the mainstream. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, going back to the Italy chapter who were three weeks into their quarantine, they said uh, they were talking about their forum experience and they are not all in the same city in Italy anyway. They yeah. had been meeting virtually and someone said, well, how is that going for you? They said, fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, that even when you're busy, even when you're doing that much in your business, you're in crisis, they couldn't believe how valuable it was to take that time to go through, meet with their forum mates, and then the energy and insights they had to go back and face the next day. And I think probably yesterday or the day before I saw posted on Facebook, a chapter in South Africa sharing its COVID-19 forum discussion notes. You know, here's mm, the question you should ask in your forum. Here's the, the the kinds of exercises to do. And that's what I love about this network. Like, people don't wait for me to give them the tools. <laughs> people just develop the tools. They And when yeah. others like it, we know it's good. So we'll be posting those South Africa tools, but you can find them on Facebook right now, I'm pretty sure. Facebook and LinkedIn, I'm, I'm guessing so. 
Yeah, I'm sure there are several several formats on and uh, platforms they'll be going out on. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I do think that form you know form is one of the key experiences for EOers, and I think even you know if you're not a member of EO, you know anything you can do to connect with other entrepreneurs. Obviously, it's good to connect with everyone, you know, family, friends, yeah. you know, all those things. But there is something about connecting with other entrepreneurs uh, in terms of you know both because they understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur, they understand that it's kind of the challenges and the mindset and the thinking, but also they have. I always found that everyone else in my world just had a different kind of perspective or understanding or had, it was tough to talk about certain things. Yeah. And my forum, my entrepreneurial group was a group that I could literally bring anything to. So if you're out there and you're not an EO member and you're looking to get some support, you know, anything you do to pull together a couple of entrepreneurs, either locally or even, you know, virtually and start talking through some of these things could be extremely helpful. One of the more powerful things you can do. Carrie, tell me a little bit about in terms of other suggestions, advice that you would have for EO members or other entrepreneurs in terms of how to kind of get through the coming you know, weeks, unfortunately, probably the coming months in terms of both the immediate situation, but also the recovery side. Anything that you've seen out there that particularly that's working particularly well, that, that entrepreneurs are doing that have been successful that you could share with the audience? Yeah, I mean, this may be obvious, but it's so core to how EO members think and behave. The self-care part mm-hmm. comes up again and again and again, that if you're not taking care of your brain, your body, you're just not going to be able to to go through this this crisis. I'm thinking of a member who was first quarantined in Shanghai and then again in Northern California. And he was talking about, yeah, you know, I think I should have started the exercising a little bit sooner in my quarantine. And those are good words of advice. I think a lot of EO members find that, you know, whether it's meditation, you name it, but that or journaling, that that self-care is really a critical element that I think EO brings because as much as it's about cash and understanding your finances, if your head is not in the game, if your body is not in the game, you're not going to be able to succeed. And I, I think that's a really strong part of EO. Another thing that maybe differentiates us from other kinds of business advice people are seeing online is the giving back. Mm. That kind of overwhelms me. And I think most of us do feel better when we do something else for, for somebody else. So there's a recent example in New Jersey where, you know, everybody in any town is concerned about small businesses, even if you're not thinking necessarily about EO members, but we know the restaurants and the cafes and we know they're all struggling. Yeah. And an EO member in New Jersey came up with the idea that people who have some means, people who have some spare cash should order food takeout from their local restaurants and have it delivered to hospital workers. Mm. And I think overnight, I think in less than a day, she raised $30,000 that way in her community. And that's just, okay, so maybe her business had nothing to do with either restaurants or hospitals, but she just wanted to find a way to make a difference. There there are lots of people who would love to buy dinner for people in their hospitals hospital while they're saving local mm-hmm. restaurants. And, and, you know, she made it easy for anybody to do in her community. And I'm sure because that was about 24 hours ago that there are probably 500 <laughs> other you know, members doing the same thing in their community right now. But you know, even myself, I find if there's a small piece of you know connection I can do from one member to another member, some small thing I'm doing for somebody else in the day really lifts my spirits. Yeah. And it might be something to think about when, when you feel like you kind of come to the end end of your mm-hmm. rope that day which is kind of daily, I think, for a lot of yeah. people right now. So, yeah, I think yeah, I certainly, you know, I plus one, the the self-care, certainly something that I've I've practiced. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of one of those things, if, if you're feeling down, go help somebody else out, right? And it, yeah. it really yeah. does, not only does it, I think, help you psychologically, but actually does some good. I mean, these things yeah. do circle <laughs> around, you know, it will it will come back to your benefit at some point, you know, sooner rather than later. But Terry, this has been a pleasure. If people want to find out more about EO, how to access some of these resources, potentially get involved in the organization, organization. Uh, what's the best way to get that information? Sure. So our website is eonetwork.org, E-O-N-E-T-W-O-R-K dot O-R-G. And if you go there today and you're not a member, you, you will see a lot of our resources are behind the firewall for members. But we are, as we speak, we've got the mock-up. We're ready to go. We're very close to um, turning the lights on a new site that will include resources for non-members. But besides that, on, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, you will see a lot 
lot of material that are that we are sharing under Entrepreneurs Org that's for the public. So I know the Italy webinar I'm speaking about has been shared a lot on Facebook and LinkedIn for anybody. That's great. I'll make sure that the the URL and the both LinkedIn, Facebook, all the handles and everything are on the show notes so people can easily click through and get that information. Carrie, thank you so much for spending some time today. I know we're in you know difficult times. I know this is you know it's it's a tough time for a lot of people, but uh, I think it's really great that we were able to kind of talk about what's going on, give people some perspective, give people some resources, and, and hopefully, you know, we can have a follow-up conversation in, in the coming weeks and months and talk about, you know, how everything is recovering and how everything is bouncing back. I know we'll get there, just a matter of time, but I really appreciate the uh, uh, the conversation we've had. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. It's really been a pleasure to talk even in these difficult times, and we should definitely do a show on the issues of recovering. Sounds great. Thanks again. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com newsletter.